Chauncey, Chauncey move. I'm doing the fresh. <laughs> Do not press. Hi, I'm Mackie Raymond, and I'm doing the 30 hour famine. It's having a lot of fun while saving a bunch of kids' lives in the world. Here at the 30 hour famine, we go without food for 30 hours, and we raise money through sponsors. That money goes towards saving children's lives in the third world. 26,000 children die every single day from hunger and hunger-related diseases. You can help people out because a dollar a day will feed, shelter, school, clothes, and pretty much everything they need to, do, to live. The famine is the opportunity to set aside our needs and what we would like to have and think about someone else. We fast for 30 hours, we sleep in boxes. It's all for the experience to see what it's like to live in poverty. You usually have so much that it's not until you have a period of time, even if it's just for 30 hours, where you're going without food, you're focusing on others. And for students, just where they're at developmentally, they need an opportunity like this. As a kid or teenager, a lot of times it seems like it's really hard to get your voice heard. And being part of this, it does feel like something's being done and I'm a part of something a lot bigger. I think a lot of these kids, you know, they hear numbers, they see, you know, statistics about, you know, hunger and just things around the world, and they don't think that they can do anything. And this kind of, you know, when you're actually able to, at the end of the famine, you know, however much money you've raised, you know, or awareness you've raised, and you can kind of put that, you know, hey, this is X amount of kids, and for the next year, they're gonna have everything they need. All right, so it's, uh, it's hour number 15, mm -hmm. and we're, uh, we're getting pretty hungry right now. I raised $2,180. It allows them to once start serving people that they normally don't. They start serving the homeless when they've never talked to a homeless person. And they're working maybe with a car wash when they've never washed a car. They're going outside of what they would normally do on a Saturday. What we're doing kind of right now is we're just doing little projects to help people, homeless people who um, just don't have as much as um, we do. So while we're helping kids in Africa who don't eat, we're also helping people in um, America who just are cold and homeless. Well, right now we're decorating boxes with um, inspirational sayings and phrases on them. And we're going to fill them with food and then tomorrow be able to take a box and give them to the homeless when they see them. I've never done this before, so I feel I feel really blessed. Like, I feel like this is what God wants um, me to be doing, and I feel like this is really gonna touch my life, and hopefully I can get out and do this more often. We're putting food into bags so that we can give them out to the homeless families and children. I've never really done anything like this, but it feels really good. Before this, I wasn't really aware of what was going on. I've seen the movies, I've seen the pictures, everything, but when it's really shown to you this well, you really understand what's happening and really want to do something to change it. It's a great experience. It totally changed my life since the first time I did it. You not only raise money to help around the world, but you raise awareness in your city and to yourself that 26,000 children die every single day. You know, there are over 2,000 references in the Bible to the poor. You cut all the verses out of the Bible that talk about the poor, and your Bible's going to be in tatters. To me, the most electrifying image of, of God's concern for the poor is found in the sermon that Jesus gave in the town of Nazareth. It's his first public message. Uh, he has been invited to speak at the synagogue. He's handed the book of Isaiah. And he stands up to speak, and he's given the opportunity to select his verse. So not only is this his first public message, it's the only occasion that we have of Jesus selecting a verse to read. Many times he quotes passages, but this is the only time he opens the, what we would call the scripture and picks a passage. And, and here's what he picks. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He's barely opened his mouth and he's already talking about the poor. 
His mission statement, if you will, is the poor, the brokenhearted, the captives, the blind, the oppressed. All these people are included in his mission statement. And then he says he's going to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, this is a reference to the practice in the Old Testament uh, called the year of Jubilee. And during the year of Jubilee, all of the land was given the year off. Let the soil recover. All the slaves were freed and all of the property was returned to its original owners. Now, as far as we know, the children of Israel never practiced this twice a century uh, recognition of God's sovereignty. But doesn't it teach us a lot? It teaches us that twice a century, God wants everybody to get a fresh start. It's like he pushes the reset button on the machinery of social justice, or he takes society like a social etch-a-sketch and he shakes it and he gets everybody back in a place where they have a fresh start. He never wants the haves and the have-nots to be so far apart that they can't see each other. It was a bad situation for my mom and my grandma. We've lived in a shelter, we've lived in an apartment complex, government housing, budget suites, and we lived in a bad neighborhood. So my, me, my mom, my grandma went to the Shade Tree Shelter. It's a homeless shelter for women and children. Men are not allowed in. And they go there in case they need help. Domestic violence goes there. And they just help them. They help them find a job and get a house. And then I usually sleep on the floor. My grandma slept on the couch. And my little sister and my mom slept on the bed. So I'd sleep next to my grandma because she has lung cancer, so I don't like her sleeping alone. In case she has like an attack or something, I'm right there. Yeah. We lived at the Shade Tree for about six months, and my little sister was born there. Shade Tree nominated my mom to get a house for, from Habitat for Humanity. Habitat for Humanity helps families to get affordable housing and heard of the situation my mom was in, so they wanted to build my mom a house. We never had a house before. This is our first house, so it's like my mom is so happy. She can like close her eyes and imagine everybody still building it and all the stuff that they did in there. We actually built our own house. So my grandma built it, my mom built it. I even helped. I put the tiles on the house, like painted the outside, uh, put dirt in, shovel rocks, did the water pipes. I just want to give back to what helped me and my family. So it's like you get and then you give. I built a garage at one of the ladies' houses. I helped frame so another lady's house. Schools will come and help Habitat. I talk to kids. I would say, hi, my name is Jeremy. I'm the HOY, Home Learner Youth. And all of us want to know if you want, would like to come out and help Youth United raise money for Habitat. If you come, like, uh, you'd probably be really surprised at what you'll find out. You'll find out how to build your own house. Like, you just have the joy of helping out others. The people that say, like, it's a waste of your time doing volunteering for people, it's really not. It's like, you're getting joy out of helping people because they'll know you helped them and they'll feel good that somebody really cares about them. And they won't be like, oh, I'm alone in the future. I know somebody that cares about me and loves me and everything. I like volunteer for people. Like I like to help the people build the houses and help the homeless women. I'll volunteer anywhere if you ask me to. The fact of the matter is a few of us have a lot while many of us don't have much. About 75% uh, of the world's resources go to about 20% of the people. The haves and the have-nots are not very close together. And this is a very complex issue. But why does it exist? Why does this disparity exist on the earth? Well, part of the answer to this complex question uh, is found in a quote by Bono. Uh, people are born in the wrong latitude. Uh, people are simply born and raised in areas of the world that don't have the basic resources that many of us have taken for granted. I'm thinking of a friend of mine who lives in Ethiopia, Dadi. He's every bit as hardworking as I am, likely more so. He's well respected in his village. He's got a delightful family. But the truth of the matter is he was born in a place that didn't have some of the basic things that, that I benefited from, you know, paved roads, access to education, vaccinations, uh, government subsidies. The things that, that, that I take for granted are things that he has never seen. He was simply born in the wrong place. What can we do about this? Well, I think the book of Acts teaches us. First of all, let the whole church get involved. 
When the apostles realized that some of the people were not being fed in the city of Jerusalem, they called for a church-wide meeting. They got everybody involved. The problem of poverty needs to engage every single person in the church. But then number two, let the brightest among us direct us. Uh, what the apostles did is they said, select your best thinkers, and we're gonna turn them loose on this problem. The problem is so big, we need our best thinkers thinking about it. That's why we need to partner with people like Compassion and, and World Vision and Living Water and International Justice Mission. These people who are giving their best thoughts and their best energy and their best hours to disentangling these difficult knots. And then number three, we can just get ticked off. Maybe you're mad about some of the things that you see in the world. Maybe you're disappointed about the way the older generation is handling this uh, challenge of poverty in the world. Well, get up and do something about it. Uh, ultimately, poverty is the lack of justice. It's just not fair. So get ticked off about it. Let your heart be stirred by the fact that 850 million people are going to bed hungry tonight and that 30,000 children will die today from preventable diseases. Let that bother you. Don't just simmer and stew about it. Get active. Do something about it. Finn and I were dating through college and uh, had been together for about four and a half years when we got engaged my senior year. We'd been long distance, so we were really excited to move back to the city where we grew up. We just kind of had this, uh, this direction for our lives that we thought things were going to go. And then the week we got home from our honeymoon, um, Ben had a very unexpected layoff at his job. We spent that time just kind of praying and asking God, like, what, you know, what is it you want from me? What, what, what do I, what can I do to really be serving you? And it's funny, Ken, he had always talked about missions, and I'd always said, I don't, I don't want to do that. I really like the work I'm doing, and I'm, I'm happy. I'm liking the American dream, so to speak. I don't want to be missing out on that. A couple weeks later, Katie brought it up again, like, do you think this would be a good time, maybe for us to start considering going into missions? And, um, all my resistance was completely stripped away. We began researching online missions opportunities overseas, and there was something very attractive to us about teaching opportunities, but a lot of the schools didn't have the right openings for us. We both wanted to teach. We wanted to teach high school, and we just, we had trouble finding the right fit. We also thought, well, God must be calling us to a Spanish-speaking country, right? Because we grew up in Texas, we have some Spanish skills and none of the Spanish-speaking schools had the correct openings. And we were just having so much trouble discerning, is this just a setback that we need to persevere through and have faith? Or is this a closed door and God is telling us this is not the way you should go? We'd never considered Haiti before and it just kind of came up and we thought, well, this isn't what we thought God was calling us to, but maybe it is. And we had eight weeks to completely shut down our lives before we moved. We sold probably over two-thirds of our belongings in the States, and we completely cleaned out our apartment, and we moved to Port-au-Prince, Haiti, to take up jobs as, as missionary teachers. I don't think you can be prepared for um, the change in culture moving to the United States to um, a place that's as poor and underdeveloped as Haiti. And I remember thinking, maybe on the third day, like, I don't know how we're gonna live here. And um, I distinctly remember the first time where I felt like life in Haiti was going to be manageable, and it was the first time we went to the market. And I remember thinking, I can do this. If I can at the very least buy bread and peanut butter and jelly, I'll be okay here in Port-au-Prince. When the quake happened, we were at home. We were sitting down at the kitchen table to think about dinner and work on lesson plans. We heard it first, it kind of escalated, and Ben just grabbed my arm and said, I think this is an earthquake. What sounded like a, a slight rumbling and a low shaking noise very quickly turned into the most violent shaking I've ever felt. Um, I don't know any other way to describe it. It just, it was terrible. It was very frightening. 
The home we were in did not suffer any damage, which in a way gave us a false sense of the magnitude and the damage of the quake. But immediately when it was over, we started to hear the screaming and the panic and the hysteria outside. Um, I remember seeing a father carrying his daughter on the street past me, and she was, she was very clearly no longer alive. Um, and I think that's when I knew that it wasn't just a little earthquake we felt, but that it was something that was really gonna, gonna change the course of our life. Yeah, this is not what we thought we were in for. I mean, we thought, okay, we're gonna make a big change, we're gonna make a big U-turn in our lives, and we're gonna go to Haiti, and we're gonna be teachers. And then, you know, after seven days of teaching, we take another huge U-turn, and we're, you know, caring for orphans, and we're carrying stretchers, and I'm, you know, in an infected wound, working on it with no medical training at all, and, you know, we're comforting elementary kids that we've never worked with before, and then, you know, it's it's just whatever that day asked for. I, I've never felt more purpose. I mean, Ben and I, as a married couple, feel such unity in this, and it's not without its challenges. It is not a comfortable life, but this is exactly where we're supposed to be. Now that I'm living here in Haiti, and I'm teaching, and I'm loving on these young people who've lost parents and who've lost friends, and as I'm trying to, um, help rebuild homes and provide food for people who are living in tent cities. It's the best place I've ever been. And I don't mean Haiti, I mean, I mean God's will.